going on here? I mean, it's harder to get in here than backstage at a Beyonce concert. They said it was bigger on the inside, but this is absolutely massive. I'm Henry Cushue, and I'm very excited to be here presenting TakeOver TV. For those that don't know, TakeOver is in its third year, and it's bigger than ever. Last year, we were in a warehouse location, but this year, we're back in the BT Sports Studio. Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> we're bringing you three films devised, shot, and produced by students from Newham College. <coughs> Wait, what? It's Nuvik, capital N, capital V. Who are you? <laughs> Oi, Henry, didn't you get the memo? You should tell them we made the show. OK, very rude, but it's all right. It is a magazine show. All three films we're showing you today are crucial. Sustainability, community and inclusivity. You literally couldn't have more important subjects. They've been developed by a team of brilliant students from New Vic College, all right? <laughs> Anywho, here's the first film. This one's about a school that's defied the odds and beaten pollution in their playground. Sport is back in Chiswick, baby. We at BT are passionate about sport. I mean, let's face it, what would the world be like without it? The world itself is on the brink. Climate change is everywhere. This is the first time at a Rugby World Cup that matches have been cancelled. It's affecting how we watch, play and enjoy sport. And if we don't come together to stop this, then we've only got ourselves to blame. 36,000 lives are lost each year in the UK due to air pollution. Dr Paolo Emilio Adami is the medical manager for World Athletics and is an expert on air pollution affecting sports people across the world. We can divide the main effects of air pollution in athletes into two big categories. We have acute effects and chronic effects. Yeah. Acute effects are related to the immediate exposition to bad air quality, and this will lead to acute symptoms, for example, coughing or a runny nose or uh, uh, itching eyes. And, and this type of acute symptoms are those that would affect athletes while, while performing, while competing, and they would impair their performance. While chronic effects, they develop over years of being exposed to poor air quality, and this, we know that this affects the heart, the brain, the lungs, and all the whole system. So, I'm at St. Mary's Catholic Primary School. However, there's a problem here. It's right next to a six-lane highway that cuts through the heart of London. On busy days, 80,000 cars pass by the school. Can you imagine how much pollution that many cars make? Where I'm standing right now is exactly the location where Andrea Carnavali began to solve this pollution problem. In 2017, the school was audited by the Mayor of London as one of the 50 most polluted schools in London. And I remember coming in, taking my son to school one morning, and I could hear the noise from the cars just beyond the wall. Shh, really loud and really... And it depressed me so much. Our school is built on an arterial road in London. On the other side of the wall that you can see behind us, there are up to three lanes of traffic, often nose to tail. Subsequently, I've learned there's 100,000 cars passing by every day. And uh, you don't need a brain surgeon to find out that that's not really good for their lungs. You know, they're growing up, they're supposed to breathe cleaner air. When we tested how much pollution there was, we had to change how we delivered sport and the timetabling of it in school. There's no miracle cure, but you know, can we tame it down a little bit? Once we had the data that showed the pollution, we had to act on it. The idea of the Green Wall came up. We got, you know, the whole community to build the biggest Green Wall that a school has ever had in England. Yeah, so building this wall, the process was doing the first fix, which was the frame and everything, and then we brought the plants in afterwards and then installed all the plants. Yeah, there's about 12,000 plants, wow. and uh, the wall is 126 metres long. So in the winter now, you've got like, mainly just um, the evergreens, but they will stay green all year round. They flourish and they, they, 
they, they grow. The best part of the job is the completion of the wall. Like you get to finish it and you get to look at your product straight away. Within sort of less than a year, the air quality around the school improved by 37% which is amazing. We couldn't actually believe it ourselves. <laughs> the, the impact of the living wall has been very important. It's really helped educate the children to being environmentally aware. They're much more interested in nature. At least we can see them playing, we can see them, you know, kicking a ball and have fun. We've been able to get back out and um, they're doing what they love to do. If in three months I was able to do this on my own, anybody else can do it. As we all know, climate change is a problem. It's increasing heat waves, it's increasing droughts, and it's increasing wildfires. Andrea and his team of volunteers transformed this school, but this kind of technology is up elsewhere in the professional sports world too. I'm going to Wimbledon to discover how they are tackling climate change. I hope you guys will come with me as we pop across town. really important for us that we ensure that everybody's visit to Wimbledon feels as environmentally positive as it can be. We have to go further faster, whether it's getting our own house in order, decarbonising our estate or creating spaces for nature like the living wall. Within the wall there's over 14,000 individual plants. We've got the purple hookera which is creating this kind of wave effect which is meant to be a ball bouncing and then there are a number of other plants that were chosen because they flower within our signature colours. I might be the sustainability manager but it's a team effort and everyone here's really got behind it and I feel really proud of that. The impact that these environmental changes have had on air pollution is amazing. Looking forward, it seems that children at school and athletes in the wider world look forward to healthier and cleaner environments to enjoy playing sports in. However, the future is in our hands. I'm 18 and I hope I can make a difference. But I'll leave it to these guys to have the final word. Super, super inspiring. That school is pretty amazing. The community there really came together to turn around the pollution problem. And it's not just the living wall that's helped reduce toxic air. They've actually put plants inside the school too. Plus, inside the building, they've got this incredible paint that absorbs pollution and purifies the air. Yo, Wait. your job's pretty easy. So what do you think of my presenting? Pretty sick, right? I mean, you're all right, hun, for a beginner. <laughs> oh, God, another guys, one. guys, <laughs> let's focus. The next VT is probably the best VT, because I made it. It's about inclusivity. It's about how women in sports getting better and better. Roll the film. So girls and boys tend to start their participation levels relatively evenly when they first start doing sport and exercise at school. What we do know is that girls become less confident the more PE they do. And it's, it's an age, particularly as teenagers, when girls are being really becoming very self-conscious about their weight, about their body image, their body is changing. And just at the time when their body is changing, and we're actually telling them things like, be very careful about how you look. At the same time, then we expect them to do sport. Just that lack of confidence and lack of experience can lead them to think that they're not even good enough to the point of even taking part. Sport for women and girls should be understood as a basic human right. I mean, if you're actually denying women and girls that opportunity, you are denying them the opportunity for joy and for good health. When I grew up, there wasn't really a lot of girls football teams, so I had to get in with boys. Everything I did in football was always proving the boys wrong. When I used to go train with my brother, I would go to an Astro pitch and the boys would look at me funny like there's a girl here playing football, so they wouldn't want me to join in. But as soon as they see me on the sign playing with my brother and they see oh, I've got some technique, then I join in. Well, no one argues that Fabiola's done a lot for women's skating, but she is a true icon of extreme sports. Well, I saw that they had a, a skate park near our house here. I thought that was amazing to see people on a skate doing like a few tricks. So I decided to try it and uh, I never stopped since. She is Fabiola and she is fabulous. You didn't see that many women doing it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, 
I don't see many women, but I think women are capable. So that that's one thing that really pushed me to to try. I always told myself, I was like, man, if I guy can do a trick, I can do a trick as well. I just have to train. Girls need to be able to see girls like them and women like them that have succeeded to be able to realize that this is something they can do. I was in a position where I was quite lucky to join Tottenham. Having access is definitely a big thing. If you don't have access to the local football clubs, then it might be a bit harder to continue careers. I think I had a teammate growing up. We used to play football together, but because she didn't have the accessibility to get to training, it was hard for her to get to big clubs, and I think that's what stopped her career. It's still very difficult to, to find a club to go and play in. Even finding netball teams, which has traditionally been one of the most popular sports for girls, can be really, really challenging. When I won competitions in a male division, of course the guys, they don't like to lose for a girl, you know? That was those kind of sarcastic jokes, but I was like, well, um, if I'm in this position, it's because I deserved and just trained as much as they did, so why not? Women in football, we challenge discrimination, so we challenge gender discrimination in the game. And there's a lot of discrimination, sadly, that does go on within football in all different areas, and gender discrimination is one of those. And our role is to try and change that, to try and drive really positive change, and let's kick discrimination out in all its form. We are one of the only colleges that does women-only sports. For some girls, they didn't feel comfortable coming to the sports hall if there was boys playing as well. So we've put on women-only sessions, which has been quite successful. So then they're still able to come in, play their sport, be active and feel comfortable and confident. I know a lot of um, females who are really introverted, but they still come to netball. And that's uh, mainly because we have a male, um, female coach, because they know that if there's any issues, uh, like female-related issues or anything, um, they can count on our female coach. Sport definitely has the potential to be inclusive, but it depends on the leadership from the top. So how's it being led? How are those organisations making sure that everyone feels equally a part of that game and that they can be a part of that sport or that activity. I think it's so cool that girls can do a guy sport or they can do things that boys perform, you know? That's why I was always pushing myself to, to see where really I could go. We have um, the Tottenham Foundation. It's nothing, they're just running sessions for girls only, so they feel more free and comfortable to express themselves. You can dream to be a professional footballer, and I think it's out there now to see that. A lot of girls are dreaming to want to be that. And I think if we continue to do that, that will only increase the volume of girls wanting to get involved. There is research to prove that uh, diverse leadership teams, diverse boards, including gender diverse boards, work better. There is greater success from them. I think we have to support women in sport because it creates a healthy society, because it creates strong, um, independent, resilient women. When I'm older, I want to be the fastest runner in the world. It's incredible how much women's sport is evolving and how organisations across the UK are challenging women's stereotypes in sports. Coming up after the break, we look at the eSport community and we ask the question, is eSport more inclusive than physical sport? Well, looks like they've gone to lunch. Very typical. Great stuff. Hiya, we are back. And next up, we have the third film on community. It's actually, no, what do you want? Who are you? What do you want? How can I help? What's, what's going on? Oh, wait, hun, 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 calm down. It's all right. Stop, OK? Look, everyone's scared, OK? Calm, calm down. I don't know what all of that is about, OK? But on a more sensible note, Takeover TV went to Donington Park Race Circuit to find out more about Team Brit, who run an e-sports squad, and a unique real-life racing team with a difference. 
My favorite sport that I play is football. I like this sport because it brings us together, regardless of your age, nationality, or culture. It's a great way to meet friends. It's a great way to socialize. I've been recently playing volleyball. I like it because I met really welcoming people in there. When I'm really having a really stressful day, and I play badminton, and I'm like, I feel so much more relaxed after. It makes everybody happy, and everybody from all sorts of backgrounds get onto that one pitch, and all the backgrounds just disappear, and you're a team. Sport can exclude people, and I think that's not necessarily because people don't want disabled people to get involved in sport. It's mo most of the time it's because they don't know who to turn to to help these people. I'm diagnosed with complex PTSD and anxiety. I have felt excluded from, uh, from sports with going outside and social interactions and social situations can be uh, a little bit debilitating. I was diagnosed with autism at about four or five years old. It was quite difficult for me. I, could, I didn't talk until I was seven. PE, um, I was part of a group that got taken away upstairs in a, like a certain area where we um, do other things, you know, use exercise bikes and stuff, because um, we couldn't do um, football. I think sport can feel exclusionary for, for some, but I think that's mainly due to, say, access to the adaptive equipment which you need to compete when you are disabled. My nearest rowing club is 30 minutes away, so it didn't exclude me from doing it, but it would have taken a huge time investment as well as mon monetary investment in order to get there as regularly as I needed to. The beauty of kind of esports is uh, you don't have to travel anywhere, funding's very minimal, and that can become a, a limit in, into physical sport. E team sports. It's really helped me as a form of therapy. And I, I've often said this to a, a couple of my uh, fellow racers on track and they've just said, you know, this, this is better than any medication. So the main differences between Team Brit and E-Team Brit are very much that Team Brit do real world motorsport and E-Team Brit do anything involves virtual motorsport. We are the largest all disabled esports team in the world. Nobody else has a full roster of all disabled players. The team consists of about 20 drivers and about five members of staff. And between us, we've created this, this community where not only do we develop drivers to become better sim racers, but we encourage them to become better people and to fit in better with society, be it that they've got physical disabilities such as cerebral palsy or they're paraplegic, or if they have neurological dif difficulties such as autism. Finding E-Team Brit really helped push me forward. As someone that finds quite difficult to interact with people um, in person because I've got anxiety and autism, I find it easier to chat to people online. So when you're playing like computer games online, you know, eSports or whatever, you come across people from, let's say, America or Asia, you can meet people with the same interests as you and you might become friends, you know, you might add them on PlayStation Network or Xbox Live. The first car which I raced back in 2011 was an E30 BMW 320i and I was playing online in Grand Theft Auto with uh, a Dutch man who also turns out he races E30 BMWs in Holland. So we had, you know, that common sense of interest and, you know, we're, we're good friends now and I'd like to go out and meet him in person. It's easier to be yourself on the internet because you haven't got that immediate reaction of physical. If you're afraid of your, your, like, your appearance and everything, you can still talk to people and they, even if they don't know what you look like, you still talk because you share the same interests and that's what's incredible about the world today. With online gaming, I wasn't so worried or insecure about anything. I was just being myself and that was really amazing. I personally think physical sport has a bigger and wider community, although esports and online gaming have a stronger community since you don't have to go to events, and you don't have to go to games to meet new people, you can just do it from your house. Before I took joining Team Brett, I was a lot very shy, I didn't have the confidence to speak to people. My mum and dad always had to be with me um, because I couldn't go to places on my own. And the team has developed me to work who I am now and I don't think I would be the same person if I wasn't part of the team. Once you're in a game, you can't be you judged. There's no barriers in our world. 
Listen, I never would have thought that by taking out the physical aspect of sport, it can really help you feel less judged. So, if you're playing online and you don't want to be seen, but you do want to feel connected, maybe you can feel freer to be yourself. And Team Brit, so inspiring to see how they've managed to empower people with disabilities to feel confident interacting on a level playing field. But actually, what surprised me most is how both in the inclusivity and community films, a lot of people talk about access, how that can make all the difference by allowing everyone to feel included in sport. Like if I had access to a gaming console or access to an all girls football team around the corner from me, maybe I might actually, actually become more sporty. Great. Oh. The most important thing is that during lockdown, it was gaming which brought us all together. Gaming was our community, and that's how we got the idea for the film. I mean, I hear you. You make some very, very good points. But I didn't see that many women in there. I can't lie. Is it because all the women are online playing and hiding their identity? Maybe that's something that we should look into next year, 100%. So we've covered inclusivity, community and sustainability, three core values here at BT Sport. I've learned so much and I hope you guys have too. Of course, it's brilliant. It was, it was, fire. Fire. It was, it was fire. So you guys suddenly don't want to show your faces anymore now? Okay, <laughs> great stuff. Thank you guys so much for watching TakeOver 2021. And given that you guys can't keep your beaks out, can I ask for one more, just one more, hell yeah. Hell yeah! Oh no! Oh crap, that doesn't sound right. I'm not gonna lie, I've had it up to here with these guys, okay? I'm done, and so is this takeover. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. Have a great day, see you next time. We gonna shut it down like this, let's go.